Biology is the head of Flip Chemical Incorporated. He is the marketing director. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. He's going to repeat them because he has the microphone. Yep. So uh, with that. Yeah, awesome. Thanks very much. Uh, can can, any warnings on time? Uh, yes, please. I need, let's say, five minutes before. I would appreciate uh, that you tell me. Yeah, good. Thank you. So uh, thanks all for being here. My pleasure being here. So this talk, and I have a lot of content, so I'm going to run. Uh, it's going to be recorded, so you can watch it like even faster on YouTube later or slower if you'd like. That's the good thing about uh, things that go to YouTube. So this talk is on four reasons why you need Istio. Or I took a different spin about talking about basics of distributed systems, right? Um, I think most people, when they're developing applications today, especially if they're in the microservice world, they kind of forget that they entered the realm of distributed systems and they don't realize that. And that's the problem, right? So that's my perspective. Things that you will not be seeing today, you will not be seeing source code, you will not be seeing cats, if you're Aww. expecting pictures of cats, <laughs> and you will not be seeing an introduction to Istio. So there's a friend of mine here that's actually going to talk maybe a little bit more introduction to Istio uh, tomorrow. Is that correct? Right, uh, Saturday? Sunday. Sunday, all right. So go there. So I will talk. Um, uh, so this is not an introduction to Istio sessions. Uh, awesome. So my name is Diogenes Rattori. I work at Pivotal. This is my Twitter handle. You can feel free to follow me on Twitter. Mostly tweet about technology every now and then, a few personal things, but it, it's a good place to catch up on things. So let's go to uh, distributed systems basics, right? Um, uh, I think the first, we, let's talk about the advantages of writing distributed applications. So what was once a big application, let's, let's, let's see the advantages of uh, distributing. They often build distributed systems, they become more reliable. Uh, they become more scal scalable just by the nature that was what was once a single piece and hard to scale. It's now distributed in smaller pieces that can probably, should at least probably scale individually, right? Now, the problem with that is that the engineering skills required to write and develop distributed systems, they are much uh, more complicated than, than you would write a single monolith app. If you're writing an application that's composed by 15, 20 different pieces, pieces, that is more complicated than writing an application that's going to be packaged as one file and run on a Android or, or mobile phone, for example. Just the, the, the basics of that, right? Also, when dealing with distributed systems, there is an increased need for tools and patterns that facilitate, right? So on patterns, I recommend a very good book by Brendan Burns, one of the creators of Kubernetes. He created, uh, he wrote a book on uh, distributed designing distributed systems. It's like a short read that you can probably read in a day. It's not even 200 pages, but I strongly recommend. And I'm going to address some of the patterns that he talked about in this book, in this session. So it's, uh, it's going to be good for that, right? Um, let's continue talking about bad news in distributed systems, right? It's, it's hard, right? So one of the other bad news in distributed systems is that you're often dealing with chains of calls. So what was once a call, or, or let's say many operations calls to functions that happen inside a single application, a single uh, package, uh, now these calls, they're happening across distributed networks of applications, right? And the problem with that, and when there's a problem with, uh, uh, let's say, one of your components, it becomes certainly much harder to debug. You can't just open a debugger and see what's going on with that specific piece of technology because first you have to know where things are failing, right? Uh, so that is a problem. So like, how do you know exactly where the problem is happening? So this is one of the problems with the distributed systems, just identifying where the fault is. Um, another problem in, that makes distributed systems hard is that you're dealing with different types of protocols. Again, if you had one big monolith, uh, most of the calls, they were internal calls, library dependencies, or just like calling a function from another functions. Uh, you don't necessarily have to deal with different types of protocols. But again, when dealing with distributed systems, some communications, they're going to be message-based. Some are going to be HTTP-based. Some are going to use uh, protobuf gRPC. Some are going to use a file base. So, like the, the just the nature that you are now dealing with also different types of of protocols makes it hard to develop distributed systems. Right. So have that in mind when you're writing microservices applications that the realm you are in, it's in the realm of distributed applications. Which uh, brings you to a very important uh, piece of this, this, this talk, which is the fallacies of distributed computing. Right? These are uh, mistakes that developers make when they're developing applications without thinking that they are now part of a distributed system network of applications. So have that in mind. Most of these concepts, they were from the 80s, and one of them was incorporated in the, in the early 90s. Right? So they're old concepts that exist in software development, but they are very important. 
first of them is that we often developed thinking that the network, uh, and there are eight, uh, the network that we're dealing with is a reliable network. They can somehow trust the network. I'm going to connect, uh, talk A to B, and as a developer, you expect, yeah, the, the call is going to get there, right? So this is a problem. We develop thinking that that's not the case. Another problem is that bandwidth is infinite. And not only bandwidth as in the ability to transmit information, but the ability to process that information. Because bandwidth stops being a problem the moment whoever is receiving a call doesn't have the ability to process that information. So more than bandwidth itself, just the ability to process information. Funny uh, uh, note on bandwidth is that while uh, in, from a technology perspective we've been able to increase bandwidth in communications by more than a thousand times for the last 10-15 uh, years, the latency is still a problem, right? Uh, just so you know, like the, the amount of time it takes from one ping, one, let's say, uh, if you make a, a call to a service from New York to London and back without zero, zero, zero processing time is 38 milliseconds just in latency, right? So often we don't think about it when developing applications, especially distributed systems. So only in physics, basic speed of light, it takes 38 milliseconds for a peak back, uh, peak back from New York to, um, to London. Right? Um, so have that in mind. The second is that we often think networks are secure. Uh, networks are not secure, and I'll give you like, a few interesting, uh, some interesting example later on. Um, topology doesn't change. This is this is one that, like myself as a developer, in my early days of development, I never thought about it. And I'll talk about it. Why? Latency zero, I, I mentioned it about latency as well, that like, we think that communication is going to immediately get where we think. And again, like, as developers, I don't remember myself thinking like 5, 10 years ago about this when developing an application. I assumed everything here was true in my source code and the things that I developed, which is wrong. Right. Uh, continuing, uh, there is one administrator, right? So that essentially means like, oh, there's one person I have to talk to. Oh, there's one, um, uh, let's say there's just a single system, but uh, there's one group of, of people. And then this, is, this has become, let's say, not so, so much of a problem lately, but when it was created, yes. Another one is that transport cost is zero. Like how much, how many times we think about the payload versus the overhead of a call, of a request when we make it, right? I don't think we do it that often, right? Unless you're dealing with, let's say, uh, unless that is a problem or impacts your business. Um, and the, often we see people doing when that starts to impact business, so like, oh, my network bill for AWS is starting to become a little bit complicated. What am I doing? How can I bring down the number of bits that I transmit? And the other one is that the network is homogenous, that the network doesn't change. So these are all fallacies. These are all things that I did, bad things that I did when developing applications that I forgot to think about that these are all lies, right? So have that in mind. And of course, this is a presentation on Istio. So I'm going to talk about four, th four things in Istio that I believe Istio help you with. Now, Istio can certainly help you with more of them, but I want to touch, especially given the time, I want to touch on four of these, right? Um, that the network is reliable. And please forget that this is, what's here is not true. They're all fallacies. So every single thing that's here is a lie, okay? Um, let's talk about network reliable, uh, just introducing the concepts a little bit. If you, there are a few ways you can uh, think about network. If you just consider MTBF, uh, main time before failure of network equipment or servers, that is already a measure of things that things go fail. Um, there's the stacking that can be applied. If you stack this, uh, routers or network uh, components in parallel, then you probably get twice the MTBF, but if you make them uh, serial, then you get half, right? So this, again, there's a, just a, a physical nature of, of, of hardware failing. Um, uh, and this is a switch, by the way. Um, and there's also the aspect that every single network that we run today is some sort of virtual network, not necessarily a cable directly connected to a switch. But you have to also factor that the machines that are running the networks they're processing many, many other things as well. That's like any Linux operating environment can have a virtual machine, uh, and that's the main thing. So we don't think about that when developing the applications, that the actual networks, they're not necessarily reliable. And these are servers. They look very bad, but they're servers. And now, the, the, the second point which I'm going to address is that the network is reliable. And I made, let's say, using some like poetic freedom here, I just changed the word uh, network from the endpoint. 
is that uh, many, many times we think that we're when we're connecting or interfacing with an external application or endpoint, we tend to think that that endpoint is going to be there for you. It's going to be right. Uh, and we don't often, often design applications thinking that whatever endpoint I'm connecting to might not be available, might not be available to handle my request, right? So I'm just switching a little bit this one from the network is reliable to the endpoint is reliable. And a big mistake that I did, which is like a very strong recommendation that I give it to you, is that I always design for reliable endpoints, assuming that whatever I was going to interface with was going to be there always, all the time. So I never had to deal with, let's say, uh, uh, let's say alternative uh, error flow flows for applications when integrating with other systems. Because during testing, we assume if these applications are not running, my application is not going to work. If these two systems that need to work together, if they're not up and running, then, then my, my application is not going to work. But many, many times, I ended up compromising the experience of my application. I'm the owner of B, A, because the application B was not running there. So a uh, very important recommendation is design for unreliable endpoints. Right? Design for endpoints that might not be there when you're developing. And again, uh, especially in microservices, and again, whenever you hear microservices, please also hear distributed uh, systems and distributed computing, because that's what's really happening. Um, the f uh, fourth fallacy that I'm addressing, and hopefully I'll talk about what Istio has to, to do with them as well. I'm okay with time, it seems. Is that the network is secure. And this is especially interesting, right? Um, and not necessarily talking about the network itself, whether or not the, a communication, let's say, physical channel, physical network channel is secure or not, but whether or not the communication between applications is secure, right? Now, how many of you remember the Equifax breach uh, about, it's not even a year ago, right? I'm sure those of you that li live in the US, they, you have to at least spend one hour of your time thinking like, how does this will impact me, right? Am I going to sign up for the, the package that Equifax, uh, Equifax is offering? So like all these things we had to think about. And when, when you think about like what created that, it was like, okay, you can sort of blame a unpatched a struts vulnerability. It's, that's how people got access to technology. But then there is unpatched software every day, right? Like we need to keep patching our software or fixing bugs every day, right? So is it, is it enough that I, as a developer, can just blame unpatched software to vulnerability like this? I think that's so naive to tell, right? Because and we all know that security is not a one-time exercise. It's a practice that you need to have. And I spent some time, invested some time, uh, reading a little bit more about like what uh, and how the vulnerability happened. And what was happening is sort of like this. So like there was an application, there was like users here, uh, evil users here. I should have like put a sad face here, talking to a external facing app that was using struts. Struts it was great technology back then. The patterns in Struts are still used. It's a mother view controller pattern. Great for separating concerns inside applications. Now this Struts app was running inside the DMZ, which is often the type of network that separates an internal network from an externally accessible network, right? Um, and this root app has access to a DMZ, the middleware zone, right? So the, now the thing is that, and that's when I say that the application network is secure, is that this Struts app had unrestricted access to other applications that it should not, right? So that's how, how the failure happened, is that someone got access to use the vulnerability to have access to the Struts application, and then this Struts app, uh, app, even though it had a specified flow of information it should go to, had access to other types of components inside the application, which were then exploited to get our data, right? So that, me, that tells me that whatever application network we had here was not secure. So when you have that in mind, that you're not necessarily talking about the physical communication networks, but also like how much information are you exposing from your application to networks? Should a database allow 30 information from 30 million subscribers to be retrieved? Should that have raised an alarm? Probably. Should I receive a call from a user that I don't know who that user is? For my receive tons of calls from a user that should not be making those sorts of calls. So those are all, let's say, red uh, alerts that we should have that 
something wrong and weird is going on. So have that in mind, application, it's not secure. Now the other one, it's uh, topology doesn't change. So as a developer, here you are developing your application. So this is you developing your application and you know, your stack overflow because you don't know what you're doing. Uh, and, then, and then you develop your application and then it runs in your machine and it's great. We always test some aspect of the application on our own machines. And I'm just using this example to justify that topologies do change, right? The topology of the network in which your application participates in your machine, that in itself, it's different from the, how the application looks like in QE in production, right? So we often think that topology is not going to change, but like just from the developing environment, the application that I'm running over here, Java application, C, Golang, just the network of that environment is going, it's, it's different than the network of other environments. So from the moment you're developing an application to the moment you're going to run that application either in a QE environment or in a production environment, the application topology is going to change, right? Um, yes, that's the point. They are different. Um, now, there are more complications, right? Uh, in terms of topology, it doesn't change. If you are dealing with um, sensitive information, either from, let's say, PHI, which is patient health information, uh, under a uh, HIPAA compliance or a PCI DSS payment car industry, I forgot the designation for DSS, there are rules that tell you that code running in production should be separated from code running in a queue environment, which often can say, you can say something that the topology of a production environment of the network is likely going to be different, right? So this is a slide from a recent, pre recent presentation given at the Boston Kubernetes meetup that I run. And I love this because it was someone talking about how they run Kubernetes in a PCI DSS environment. So like how to run Kubernetes in an environment where it's going to be handling and dealing with credit card information. And there is a rule and in the PCI DSS that says that separate development test environments from production environments and enforce separation with access controls. This is again just find that yes, topologies are different. If you're developing, assuming that the way things look in your laptop are the way they look in a looking production, mm, that's not probably a good assumption. Now, with the fact that the policies do change, a, another problem comes to us, which is how do we deal How do we deal with changing topology in an effective manner? And this is where bad news comes, right? This is uh, data from the last uh, DevOps, uh, State of DevOps report, the 2017. Uh, and this tells that only 28% uh, of the high performing companies, high performing companies, uh, have automated uh, configuration management for their applications, right? This is very bad because like, the very performant companies, the ultra high performant companies, what does it mean for that, at least in that context, one of the metrics is that you're able to turn in a code change in production in less than one hour, right? And this is not how long does it take for you to the deployment. It's like from the moment a code is pushed to a repo, how long does it take for that code to be packaged, tested, and deployed and run in production, right? So companies do that, and that's the effective companies, they do that in less one hour. This metric is called the lead time, right? So the lead time between a fix is fixed or a new feature is implemented, it's in, core, it's in code, it's in a repository, and from the moment that reaches production. So the lead time, it's one hour. So companies that are ultra high performant, they do that in less than one hour. So it's one hour from the moment the code is there to the code is running in production, right? Passing, of course, many gates, many checks. Sometimes there are even manual checks. But the problem is that dynamic configuration management is hard. And I tell you it's hard because the very high performing companies, only 28% uh, of them do that. Uh, so it's, it's complicated. It's very complicated. Um, so there is, again, manual steps involved in that. Uh, uh, and, and the fact about the, the point about topology changing and dynamic configuration management is that you should be able to dynamically know where things are running, right? So if you need to someone to change the IP of a database uh, manually, that's not necessarily dynamic configuration, right? Um, happen. If the endpoint of an application changes from uh, one IP to the other and someone has to do that manually, if the port changes and someone has to do that manually, that's not dynamic configuration management, right? Um, Hopefully, you know that there are ways to do this. And, and to talk about bandwidth is infinite, I'm going to have to derail this conversation a bit. So that's why the tracks, and apparently an arrow that you're getting off tracks. 
Um, good. So um, again, uh, concepts from the distributed systems, designing distributed systems book. There are three ways uh, uh, you can, sorry, three patterns for designing distributed applications. Three groups, actually, right? So there's a single node group, which is uh, techniques that you apply to applications running close to each other uh, in a single node. So even though it's distributed systems, you still can take advantage of uh, running uh, patterns such as sidecar, sidecar pattern or ambassador pattern, which is you bring some sort of intelligence close to the workload that you're running. There's also serving patterns, which is the mo more popular one. So you have like a web server and you replicate that web server. You have 10 copies of that web server. That is a distributed system pattern. Uh, and batch, which is the name says it's batch, right? So again, the stateless, it's very popular. You just have like a stateless application and you need to do something with it. You replicate as many copies as you'd like because they don't handle state or state is handled somewhere else, right? State is always handled somewhere, so we stateless is kind of complicated to say there's also there's always state being handled somewhere. You just make many copies of the exact same application and you're good with that, right? Now sharded, it's another pattern for distributed and, and sharded is especially used when there's a, a, a very large amount of data involved. Because think about that, uh, if the data is small enough that you can have copies of data, keep them consistently like in many nodes, if it's small enough then there's advantages in keeping that. But when when you have large pieces of data and it's expensive to keep copies of the all uh, uh, all all the data, then you start thinking about charting, which is when you distribute the data. You get the data and distribute it so that uh, you don't have to store all the data all the time in all the replicas, right? Um, if you're doing charted right, you should always think that having one replica of the data, it's not enough. If that goes down, you're going to have disruption. You don't want disruption. So often write uh, sharded data deployments, they come together with replicated data models. So there is some part that's sharded, and you're also replicated parting of that data somewhere. Right? Um, the scatter and gather, this is more for processing. Uh, if you heard of MapReduce, or if you heard of like it's a, a similar patterns where you try to distribute the processing, you load into many leaves. It's in a tree model. You distribute to the leaves, and then after you finish processing, at a point in time, you're going to then uh, reorganize that data in a, in a way that makes sense. So, so when you're dealing with processing data, that's also coming. So. And then there's my, my uh, batch. Batch is another one, of course, that's very popular. You just uh, normally schedule jobs. You, there's a list of tasks and operations that you want to run, and you use batch model for, de for that. Um, now, my favorite, and the session right before this one was a little bit about this, it's, um, it's event-based, right? So for me, in, the, in my opinion, the largest, the ultra uh, great advantage about serverless is that it's event-based, right? It's not request response based, it's an event. You're going to process, you're going to consume capacity, uh, hopefully when you get an event that tells you that you should do that, right? Uh, often messaging based systems, they are, uh, they're, they're um, event based. So as I said, two today very common types of distributed computing uh, that are event based is serverless and function as a service. Have you ever seen a serverless data center? This is how serverless data center looks like. It's amazing, right? How did they do that? We don't know. I, oh, sorry, a cat. <laughs> I know, I lied. There was a cat. All right, good. So congratulations. You are now our um, certified uh, distributed system developers, right? I even have uh, my certificate that uh, I printed for me. So um, after finishing this part, part of the presentation, I am now a officially certified distributed systems developer by the Distributed System Institute. Of course, I just made this up. But uh, the point is that like, now that you know like, the, some of the hard problems that are involved in de developing distributed systems, you should factor that in your development, in your day-to-day -day activities. Okay? Now, finally, <laughs> like, I only have, like, I don't know, 10 minutes, a little over 10 minutes, and I'm finally going to talk about like something that was in the title of this presentation. But for me, it was very important to give you the idea that, yes, microservices development is distributed systems. There are tools and patterns. So when I talked about tools and patterns that make your life easier when developing microservices applications, this is one of them. This is a very good one, right? So the first thing that I'm going to address using Istio, and when I took the picture of this slide, uh, so apologies for the uh, lack of focus there is that uh, the network is secure. So assuming, so this is a lie, so the network is not secure. So how, what do we do then 
to make sure that we can handle the problem of networking security. So one of the things that Istio has out of the box, it's ability to support mutual TLS, mutual transport layer security. That means that if you're talking from endpoint eight, endpoint A to endpoint B, they know each other, they are trusted, and you have formally established that they can communicate with each other. And you know why this is important? Because if we assume the network is secure, it's not, it might be the case where an application like this Truth app that access another one, and you know as an architect that that show flow, not, sh flow should not have happened, right? So again, there are technologies, you still with Mutual TLS can help you with that, so that it allows you to formalize the information flow. So if you as the data architect for the application or the architect, you know what systems should be used for a specific business functions, then that should be formalized, right? This application can only talk to this one, not in, in no one else, and under what circumstances. So have that in mind, the Istio with Mutual TLS allows you to specify a secure communication channel formalized, right? So it's not only like, okay, I'm gonna add uh, transport layer security, uh, and everybody has transport lead security, uh, but everybody has can talk to me. No, you're actually specifying who are you expecting to be interfacing with. So that calls, um, so you reduce the risk. Again, like security is a practice, right? So you always have to do these sorts of exercises, right? Uh, the other, it's on topology, doesn't change. Do we all believe now that topology does change? Is that, is that okay? So you understand that from just from your basic development environment, from, from the, to the QE environment that your application topology is going to change, right? And in order to help with that, you need to have in mind dynamic configuration management, right? Which is hard, but if you have dynamic configuration management in mind and you do that as part of your activity, you're gonna be, let's say, uh, in less trouble. So one of the things that Istio does with the uh, addressing dynamic configuration management is that there is a piece of, uh, there is a component in Istio called pilot that knows where the endpoints are. And when as new endpoints come and go, they get notified of their existence. So if endpoint foo version three comes up, it will notify pilot that there is an endpoint foo version three up is available. And anyone that wants to interface with that endpoint, pilot will know exactly where that endpoint is and all the, the, the versions that are available for that endpoint and even more like how many times you can call that point and under what circumstances. So again, to address the fact that topology does change and dynamic configuration, Istio can help you with that. So that was reason number two for Istio, uh, dynamic configuration management of endpoints. Um, very good, so this is the example though. Okay, let's say my application running in node A under a certain IP, under a certain network changes, and it's now running in a different network uh, under a different IP. Uh, still, pilot is going to be notified of this change, and you can have access to that information if you want to call that application, right? Um, again, topology will change because, because it does change. Now, I think the, the network is reliable on is also very interesting, right? Because sometimes we, we, think, we think about compromising our application because we didn't necessarily provide the real users of our application with the, the necessary uh, <clears throat> priorities that they need, right? So in case I have an application from A to B, right? And again, do I want to, as owner of application A, do I want to disrupt my own experience because B is not running? And what sometimes happens is, is that we, knowing that some things are failing, we still wait for failure. Like, I'm gonna talk to application B, I know it's down. I'm still gonna wait for a timeout. I'm gonna to talk to application B, I know it's down, I'm still gonna wait for a timeout. So the user experience, the end user experience gets disrupted, even when you know that the other application that you're interfacing with, it's not responding. So why wait for a failure if you could know right now that's not working and keep the call local, right? So one of the things that Istio does is that through circuit breaking, it opens the circuit, it knows that that application is not responsive and every many calls or every many minutes, you can then call that application again to see if it has come back up, right? So the fact that you're not waiting for failure increases the overall response time of your application, right? Because you're not waiting, waiting for things to go down, to fail, and then do something. You know that they are down, right? Um, so, and then the fact that there is a centralized repository that knows the applications that are up or not, any new application that wants to access the same application will also know that the application is failing 
and then can keep the, the call locally, right? Again, increasing reliability, not having to wait for failure. Um, and uh, to address the bandwidth with is infinite, it's, it's, it's rating and limiting. The rating and limiting is mostly and often associated to API management, but uh, I think API management is changing a bit. It was only seen as <coughs> a technology for external APIs, but more and more we see internal APIs. If you're dealing with microservices, multiple applications, distributed systems, you actually have multiple APIs internal to your applications. In the same way that you would only, let's say, if you have ever used the Google Maps API, if you want to make more than five calls, I think, per second, you have to pay, you should also have that level of, um, that level of, of control inside your organization, right? There are more important, your uh, more important applications inside your organization, uh, and you should prioritize those, right? In the sense that, let's say, if you have a mission critical application and others, you should probably give that mission critical application the ability to have received more requests than just, uh, just a regular application, right? Imagine that you might have other applications impacting mission critical application. So one of the things that Istio can do as well is the ability to add rating and limiting to your application so that uh, you don't necessarily fall into the fact or fall into assuming that your bandwidth is going to be infinite, right? You can give each individual user, and you can do that in a job base, like JSON Web Token base, individual users, you can give them different levels of, uh, let's say, <coughs> uh, permission to your application in terms of number of requests and requests per second, right? Uh, so given that I have two minutes, uh, let's go to the summary, right? So um, addressing the four, uh, distributed system policies that I talked about. Network is not reliable, and for that, recommendation is that you can use circuit breakers. Uh, the network is not secure. The recommendation is that you can use mutual TLS. Topology changes. The recommendation that uh, the, the recommendation is that you use dynamic configuration management and discovery. You still can do that, uh, and that the bandwidth is finite. So the recommendation is that you use rating and limiting for that. Um, so that's it. Um, Twitter handle is Retori. Um, and that's what I wanted to talk to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we do have a couple of minutes for questions, so if you have a question, I can repeat the question then. Four minutes, so yeah, four minutes. All right, I'll be in the back if you want to talk to me individually. And this is a topic I'm very passionate about, so feel free to reach out to me. Thank you very much. Have a good day.